Okay, our next presenter is uh, Arto Uskalio. He graduated as a naval architect from the Helsinki University of Technology in 1992. Worked as a project engineer and project manager at Kaverner Massa Yards Arctic Research Center during 1992 to 1999, taking part in ship design, model testing, research and development, and field work in the Russian Arctic. He joined ABB Azapod in 1999 as a sales engineer, and from there he moved to ABB Marine Sales Organization in 2000. He worked as a sales manager during 2000 to 2007, having various responsibilities. From January 2005 till December 2007, he was in charge of the icebreaking vessel sales. He moved to Azapod Concept Development in January 2008 and acted as the director of Azapod Concept Tech Development. In 2009, in September 2009, he joined Acker Arctic Technology Incorporated. Current responsibility area is sales and marketing. Please join me in welcoming him. Just a moment. No. It's not here. Okay. Yes, thank you, Dermot, for the kind introduction. Uh, so I will not tell you more about myself. I will concentrate on the company slides and, and the actual topic. Dermot promised uh, a couple of slides from the company, and I think that's in that sense good because it shows a little bit of the background why I'm talking about the logistics. And uh, I had a little bit problems making the presentation because actually it was a two-hour company presentation and an afternoon lecture for the uh, logistics and, and to try to squeeze it in 10 minutes, it's a little bit difficult, but I will try to do that. Uh, Acre Arctic as a company was established in 2005, but uh, we had a, a long uh, uh, history uh, working uh, in, in the, uh, as a research and development department at the Helsinki shipyard. And the reason why Finland is uh, uh, so, much so much focused on, on building icebreakers is that uh, Finland is practically the only country where all the harbors are frozen during the winter time, so we need uh, icebreakers and ice strength cargo vessels to get our export and import uh, uh, working. And uh, this 60% market share, it's uh, practically icebreakers. Today, we, there is not so much anymore pure icebreakers, but it's more like uh, uh, ice-breaking vessels, uh, but uh, originally this 60% was, was for icebreakers. And uh, as a company, what we do, we are in that sense vertically uh, uh, directed so that we, we start from the very, very uh, ice properties, ice conditions. We do a lot of uh, field work in order to measure the ice in the operation area or the planned operation area. Uh, based on that information, we derive uh, the design basis for, for example, uh, for the route selection, for uh, ship designs, for ice classes that to be used in the area. We can do, based on that information, we can do fleet optimization and also training. And uh, uh, I think mostly we are known today from our ship designs and, and testing services we run an ice model basin in Finland uh, where we can test uh, uh, models in, in ice. Uh, the scale of the mo uh, or the maximum size of the model is roughly 10 meters. And uh, in ship designs we do different feasibility studies and from concept design up to basic design uh, services. Our customers are ship owners, shipyards, oil and gas companies, uh, equipment manufacturers, and uh, 
like, for example, classification societies. And recently, especially, we have had uh, governmental vessel design projects, and these are the, let's say, ongoing, uh, currently on ongoing projects. So we have the China State Oceanic Administration ordered a design for the new polar research vessel, ice breaking capability 1.5 meter at 2 to 3 knots. Then we are designing the Canadian Coast Guard together with our sister company at SDX, uh, and we are responsible for, let's say, everything below the waterline, and, and uh, uh, like the hull form, hull strengthening, propulsion, propulsion strengthening. And uh, the ice breaking capability of the new vessel is determined to be 2.5 meters at two knots. Uh, we are also, or we have designed the new Russian Minister of, uh, vessel for Russian Minister of Transportation. It's a uh, totally new kind of vessel, oblique icebreaker, which can break the ice in an uh, actually sideways or an, in an oblique angle to be able to either assist large tankers or then uh, collect oil effectively. And the ice breaking uh, capability of this vessel is one meter at three knots. And uh, we are also finishing our designs for the Finnish transportation agency for the latest uh, Finnish icebreaker. Unfortunately, there is no public image available yet. I think the image publication is, is next week so that then we should have it in this slide. And it's a replacement project for the icebreaker Voima, which has been in service since 1954. So, long time. Uh, Dermot showed uh, more on the Canadian and U.S. projects. I, I look at this from the worldwide perspective, the, the projects, and, and not listing so much of the different projects, but more of the areas. So we have East Coast Canada, Greenland Coastal Waters, uh, Northern Caspian Sea, uh, Barents Sea, Petchora Sea, Kara Sea, uh, Beaufort Sea, and the Canadian and uh, U.S. side, Chukchi, and then uh, uh, Gulf of Ob or Ob Bay and Yamal Peninsula. Then we have Okotsk Sea and Kamchatka area and then uh, Northern Sakhalin. And there is uh, various projects which are at different levels of uh, uh, operation. For example, Sakhalin area, there has been several different oil fields which have been uh, producing since 2008. Uh, background to Arctic uh, uh, logistic al Arctic operations, of course, uh, one of the biggest issues is the environment, the environment protection, and of course, like we saw, saw today or heard today already in the morning, the local com communities play a big part in the development and how the development should be run. There is actually quite big difference uh, comparing the Russian side and the Canadian and U.S. side. So in the Russian side, it's mostly centrally governed so that the local, uh, local uh, uh, communities are not so much allowed to participate in the development by uh, contrast to the uh, U.S. And, and Canadian side. Of course, the environmental permits are a big issue. And uh, because the uh, projects are expensive, so only big projects can be developed Operation is seasonal or highly affected by the seasonal changes. It can be open water, it can be extended season, it can be year-round uh, operations. One uh, uh, important thing which is affecting very much on the design and the planning is the remoteness uh, of these fields. So the, all, all the su supply and service uh, uh, functions are difficult to arrange. But also there is, uh, like it was said today, there is uh, it's in the middle of nowhere, and, and when, when some of these fields are really in the middle of nowhere, so there is no infrastructure, and either uh, it has to be built there, or then all the people have to, have to be, all the workers have to be transported uh, through long distances. It's purpose-built vessels for the production phase, it's cargo and auxiliary vessels, but there is also a shortage of different kinds of auxiliary vessels during the production development. Uh, whether it be seismic vessels, drilling vessels, dredging, heavy lift vessels, uh, regular PSVs and uh, anchor handlers, because all these vessels have to be winterized and having uh, some uh, minor uh, ice class or even higher ice classes. 
and today there is uh, no such vessels available. And uh, logistics plays a crucial role in the field development. Uh, ice and cold am amplify the effect of the uh, delays, and even short delays can uh, result in one lost season, meaning that if you don't do it this year, you have to wait for the whole year before you can do it again. So in big projects, this means a lot of cost, save, uh, cost and, and uh, redundancy and planning are, are more important in the Arctic projects than you would have in your open water projects. And the uh, effect of faults is also amplified so that if, you don't, if the ice-breaking vessel doesn't have the full power, it can mean that it cannot uh, uh, proceed in ice. So we have more parameters than in open water projects. Uh, and effect of ice is uh, uh, on operation, it's very often difficult to calculate and estimate. Planning is more difficult and it is worthwhile to put more effort on optimization of the transportation system and logistics. And uh, from logistic point of view, you have to think about independent cargo vessels or then uh, icebreaker assisted operation, transshipment to directly or, or directly to destination. And we are using simulation tools to uh, make comparison of different ships, different fleets, and different routes. And uh, logistics, it's not only needed for cargo vessels, it's also for the seismic uh, exploration drilling, supply operations, production drilling, there's also the supply operations, uh, production block transportation, and uh, for example, dredging cargo transportation. And it's a big difference in development of different types of fields, whether it be onshore, offshore, uh, the remoteness, how far away it is, and, and uh, lack of suitable resources. And of course, the, uh, everybody knows the, about the ice, icebergs, icing, and, and uh, difficult conditions. And this shows uh, slightly about the different variations if, uh, depending on the water depth. And uh, when we compare uh, an open water offshore field so the development time typically is 9 to 15 years from the lease, uh, seismic inv investigation. But in the Arctic, if we think, think about, for example, just the exploration drilling, so here's a plan for the Azurak field for the Beaufort Sea. So it's uh, roughly 10 years just for the exploration drilling to get one, one single hole drilled. And uh, because I'm running out of time, I will not continue reading, <laughs> reading this out loud, but you can have this presentation if you want uh, from me. Thank you. Thanks very much.